We all ready to get diseasy? <laughs> you all look scared. You're in the back of the room. Yeah, so it's okay to move up closer if you if you'd like. If if you just want to sit in the back and sleep, no offense either. There. Um, my name's Damon Smith. I'm the extension field crops pathologist at UW Madison. I'm also a professor in uh, plant pathology uh, there on campus. I spend um, a large majority of my time working on epidemiology and, and disease systems, so trying to understand how diseases move through agroecosystems. And sort of nestled in there is a, is a management program on various crops, including corn, soybeans, wheat, and alfalfa. Um, while, you know, a majority of my program is, is sort of grounded in the conventional side of things. One thing you might not realize is that from a disease management perspective, chemical controls are actually a pretty recent thing in, in, the, in conventional production systems. So pathologists by training have spent a lot of time sort of coming at things from a more of a cultural uh, strategy and then, and then resistance. And you'll kind of see that kind of play out here. So bear in mind that while a lot of this is done in conventional fields because uh, you know you probably don't want to show up at your farm uh, and putting pathogens in your farm so that's one thing we struggle with so so keep that in mind we don't focus so much on yields in our program we focus a lot on, on disease management disease reduction so you're going to see some yields that may be a little off track from what you might see in a normal organic system just just remind yourself that these are in more of a conventional field situation where we're managing them uh, organically. Kelly, why don't you introduce yourself? I will say we're going to do this conversationally as well, uh, so we're going to talk back and forth. Feel free to stop us and ask questions. If we don't get through the whole slide set, that's great too. Kelly. <clears throat> so I'm Kelly Debbing. I am a master's student in um, partly in Damon's lab and then partly in Aaron Silva's lab, so I'm co-advised. Um, and my project is mostly what we'll be working about today. Um, are talking about today because it's really geared toward organic farmers and transitional farmers and specific ways that they can control disease. So just to give you a little overview, um, I'll give you a background on the trials that we've been working on the last two field seasons. We'll talk a bit about the different OMRI approved fungicides that are out there. Um, well, I'll go into the results of the three different trials um, and then we'll just kind of wrap it up with some takeaways that we've learned along the way. So like I said, the whole purpose is to help organic farmers specifically. Um, and we're looking at three different major diseases in three different crops. So we've got a corn, a soy, and a wheat trial. And we're looking at all sorts of different management techniques. So we're looking at plants with some genetic resistance. We're looking at input-based techniques. So different OMRI approved fungicides versus um, no treatment or a conventional treatment. And then in some cases, agronomics, like tillage, roller crimping, that sort of treatment as well. And I will mention that this is a, a joint uh, project between our university and Purdue University. So all these trials that we conducted here in Wisconsin, they also conducted in Indiana. So all the data I'm gonna be sharing is both of those put together. Just to give a little overview about OMRI approved fungicides, there's a lot of different kind of categories for them. Um, so this slide has a list of all the different fungicides that we tried in at least one of our three trials. Um, so the different groups, um, we've got our mineral based, mostly copper based. These are kind of the old school organic fungicides. Um, so we had two different products, a badge, X2 and Champion, which fall in that category. We've got a type of bio fungicides that's plant based. So that's just extracts taken from plants um, and used as a product, so that's paste setter. Uh, and then we've got the oxidation reaction, so hydrogen peroxide based products, um, oxidate falls under that category. And those are really things that have been used as like contact disinfectants for some time. And then we have kind of the hot new biofungicide category where you've got those like actual living microbes um, so we've got several different products in that category. Um, most of them have a, a bacteria source in them. Some are um, fung fungal based. Um, so there's several products there as well. And those can kind of work in different ways. Sometimes they might just compete for space and outcompete with the pathogen. Sometimes they might actually be a predator to that pathogen and eat off that. 
Um, so there's a few different kind of avenues that they can work in. And of course, the question that everyone would love to know about these products, do they actually work? Um, and that's a great question. So kind of those fungicides end up in two different camps. We've got those older fungicides where we've got like those copper based products. Some of the first fungicides were like lime or sulfur based. And then we've got those, um, we know that a lot of those are effective. Um, that's why they're still used even though they've been around for a long time. But we also know that there are drawbacks to those. You can have them build up in soil. So these things aren't things that you want to just apply, apply, apply. And then we have those newer camps. Um, the efficacy under field conditions is, yeah, it's variable. Um, and that little picture up there is to kind of emphasize that. Um, so imagine you've got, in this case, we'll go with trichoderma. So it's a fungus that's a parasite on some um, plant parasitic um, fungi. So imagine that that's the green guy, is our biofungicide. The red one is our plant pathogen that we don't want. And when you put the two in a petri dish, it might do a great job at finding that pathogen and destroying it. But then you throw that in a field condition with tons of other microbes around and they might not even find each other. Um, so that is really kind of the base of what complicates whether these things actually will work in field conditions. And kind of to bring it back to the bigger picture, um, as you all know, these fungicides are only a small part of a big integrated pest management um, landscape. Um, so kind of different things in that realm uh, that we always keep in mind are starting with high quality seeds, um, planting at a proper time, um, just doing things to prevent or disrupt pest development in the first place. Um, like altering the surroundings, different types of crop rotation, tillage, irrigation choices can really affect whether those pathogens can take off or not. And then a big keystone is just growing plants that are um, genetically resistant to those pathogens. Um, but then we also want to be scouting for disease and knowing when that disease is starting um, and using disease prediction models. Um, there, there's some different apps out there like Tar Spotter and Sporecaster that can help with that. And then when we do see that disease starting, then we can go to those different mechanical or, or biological or chemical methods to help control that as well. Damon, do you want to talk a little bit about tar spot? So, yeah, so, um, so how many in this room have dealt with tar spot? A few hands, probably 50-50 in the room. This is it's a really hot topic right now. Uh, those of you who might know who've dealt with this is a rel relatively new problem for us in the US, okay? So 2015, it shows up in Indiana and Illinois. 2016, we have it here in Wisconsin. We've dealt with this problem every, every year since, okay? And so what's, what's really driving this, uh, this, this disease? Well, it's, it's wetness, right? So we are transitioning to, you know, we can sit here and debate climate change if we want. Uh, I'll do that with you over a beer maybe later on while it's snowing. But uh, we can all agree that it's getting a little warmer and where we have warmer temperatures, we have more moisture aloft, right? And so we can document it in, in our climatic history that we're transitioning uh, to wetter summers, uh, generally speaking, or at least summers where we might have an extreme drought and then we go very wet, right? So we have the extreme cases as well. And that's what's really driving um, tar spot, right? So we, we have residue, once it's established, it can overwinter on this residue. We've done work in our lab on this. Uh, and then these wet environments is what's really pushing it. So that residue has spores on it. Those spores are then wind and rain splash dispersed. Uh, up, up into the lower part of the canopy and then we have a repeating cycle. So as the weather continues to be rainy or wet or we have long periods of leaf wetness, uh, it can continue to move up the canopy. With that said, uh, temperature uh, is important, but our 2021 epidemic really taught us that you know, we, we can't be complacent when it comes to temperature. We all thought it was a cooler temperature that really drove this. That is true. That is what's optimal. So somewhere in the 68 to kind of 75 degree range seems to be the optimal range. But 
temperatures of 100 degrees do not kill this. It is not lethal, right? So when we have those conditions that then return to what's favorable for that fungus, it can continue to move, okay? And we learn that painfully the hard way in 2021. So keep that in mind that for a lot of these pathogens, they're pretty hardy. They can hang out in these extreme environments and then when it gets more favorable for them, they can then uh, transition back into a more um, you know, aggressive state on, on those uh, plants. Uh, once the, the fungus sort of gets moving and it moves up the canopy here, there is also a perception that it, it, it moves very quickly. I actually classify this pathogen as sneaky. And it's sneaky because it has what, what we call a very long incubation period. So from the time it actually infects the plant to when it actually shows up in the field can be as long as say three to four weeks. Okay, and so keep in mind, that if you're gonna use scouting, which I think is okay in corn, look in that lower canopy, but once you already see some tar spots in that lower canopy, remember you also have other infections that have already occurred. So being in the field on it as fast as you can is gonna be really key. Okay, yeah, question. The question is, I have a clue to this, so is tar spot exclusive to corn, or is it showing up in other crops? Yeah, excellent question. So the, the question is about, you know, tar spot and its host range. And fortunately for this particular pathogen, this particular species is, is corn-centric. So it's only known to go to corn. And the population is, is reasonably not diverse. So we really only have two different types. One's a Caribbean type and one's a Mexican type. It doesn't really matter. They seem to move and operate the same way. So it's a little different than some of the other pathogens that have multiple hosts. So that's a good piece of the story is that, you know, it really is a corn-centric pathogen. So corn-on-corn no-till systems are usually where we see it really show up and be really aggressive. Yeah. So, so Kelly, let's talk a little about uh, some of your trials here on tar spot. And I'll kind of let you take the floor and, and talk through uh, what you've been doing. So... Over the last two years, we've had um, tar spot trials. Um, so for the susceptibility of the hybrid, um, we use two different hybrids, um, both Viking hybrids. They're both actually related to each other, but one was a pretty recent release, and it's more resistant to the pathogen. Um, and I say susceptible, but it's not an all or nothing sort of game. One is just seems to be more resistant than the other one. And then we're looking at six different fungicide treatments. Um, so we had a non-treated plot where we didn't spray anything. We also had our uh, conventional treatment to kind of give us a, a positive control. So we used Headline Amp for that. And then we used four different Omri approved products. Um, so we've got Actinovate, um, that's one of our biofungicides, Badge X2, which is a copper fungicide, Oxidate, so that's our hydrogen peroxide, and then Seraphel, bacillus, so it's another bacterial um, biofungicide. And our two years are a bit different. So the first year of our trial in 2021, we didn't have that resistant hybrid yet. So in this year, we only used the more susceptible of the two um, corn hybrids. Um, so all we really had was our fungicide treatments to compare. And I will say that our disease levels were a bit different in 2021 versus 2022. I don't know, maybe you all saw the same thing if you had core in either of those years. Um, so on the bottom of the graph, you'll see our different treatments. On the side, it, you'll see standardized ADPC, which is a complicated number that really just measure, measures the relative overall disease intensity through the entire season. Um, but just to give you a better idea of what that actually equated to, um, the disease severity that we saw on the ear leaf of the corn, um, basically the amount of it that was covered with those tar spot um, uh, spots, was 31% of the leaf was covered. Uh, and that was around like the R5 growth stage at our last disease rating. Um, so compared to the non-treated control on the far left, you'll see what we would expect, that conventional product, that headline amp, had a significant decline in our disease level. Um, then you'll also see next to it badge, which is that copper treatment, also had some reduction compared to the non-treated. Um, but again, there's also the emphasis on this is a copper product. This isn't something that we can necessarily use a ton of. Um, so it does have kind of a give and take there. And to give you a better visual of what that actually looked like in the field, so this was around the time of our last, um, our last disease rating. So again, it was like R5 growth stage. 
And we've got our non-treated control on the left and then our um, conventional fungicide on the right. So you can just see some of that early senescence going on. Um, if the tar spot gets bad enough on there, the plant just starts to kind of die off early. In 2022, we added that second hybrid. Um, so on the left-hand side, you'll see the, the disease levels of the two different hybrids compared to each other. Um, and I do want to preface that the second year, our average disease severity on the ear leaf was only 3% versus the 31% the year before. So our disease levels overall were just much lower. Um, but even though they were lower to start with, we still saw significant differences between those two hybrids. <coughs> So just choosing that more resistant variety, the 5296, uh, really made a difference. And then on the right, we've got our test weight and our yield, just to show that um, there wasn't any significant difference there between those. And I will also mention that in the second year, after we added that resistant um, hybrid, and maybe it's that, maybe it's just the fact that there wasn't high disease to begin with, but none of our fungicides did anything significant. Um, so even the conventional didn't really make it done in the, um, in the disease levels. Do you guys do any soil testing prior to these? I mean, do you check the conditions of the soil that the corn is being planted in? I guess from a, are you talking just from a corn health standpoint? Is I'm that? Talking from a, yeah, from a soil, soil health standpoint, is that soil ideal for giving that corn the best shot. In this case, yes. I mean, we're doing, we're doing this work at Arlington, so we're usually planting, you know, when the heat units are there, we're, you know, not going into heavy ground. These are in tilled or no-till proper conditions and that sort of thing. We don't necessarily go in and test, you know, to see what soil health microbes might be there and that sort of thing. We are doing fertility tests so that we know what available nitrogen we have is there and so that we can also supplement for nitrogen. So, you know, again, use the yields here sort of, you know, we don't care as much about yield in my program because we're disease management uh, folks, but these are probably a little off what you might see in an organic type system. And the reason for that is these are conventional fields. Yeah. The reason for that from a standpoint is, you know, I've been taught that the first thing you want to do is make sure your soil is in good health. You can drop great seed in there and you know if the soil isn't ready to sustain it or is missing valuable nutrients then it's it's going to be a weakened specimen yeah so you're bringing up the, the so the the discussion here is you know how does plant health affect disease onset and progression basically right and that is variable in different pathosystems what's interesting about this particular pathogen is what we call an obligate parasite so the healthier the plant, the longer it's green, the, the more opportunity actually the fungus has. Okay, so some of these organisms actually monopolize a healthy plant, and this is one of those, okay? There are other diseases where we actually look at, um, you know, a plant that maybe is struggling, uh, being predisposed uh, to diseases, and that is true in some of those other pathosystems. And we'll, we'll actually talk about um, sclerotinia and, and some of these things here. So it is a it is a case by case, unfortunately, with disease, you know, and so this is one of those ones that it doesn't necessarily hold true that you need high uh, uh, or low levels of nitrogen. It could be somewhat variable. So that brings us to you know just just our management here. Um, and one thing I Kelly's probably sick of hearing me say this, but you know my my first point is it always going to be resistance. Okay, that's going to be the foundation of our. Uh, disease management programs, we have to have good genetic resistance, and I'm not talking about GMO, I'm talking about conventionally bred resistance. We've been doing this a long time. Humans have been manipulating and breeding and crossing for centuries. We need to make sure we're still doing that, okay? And I think we're lost sometimes in just going after yield, yield, yield all the time. We need to bring that resistance back into our modern, modern hybrids, yeah. In your opinion, are we going to have better luck managing uh, this pest in the organic system through continued breeding of resistance in the varieties, or do you think the industry is going to eventually be able to come up with some sort of biological control? Yeah, so the question is, are we going to uh, continue to go after breeding or biological control to kind of win this? 
I actually think that breeding is probably going to continue to be where our foundation is going to be. There's ongoing work. We've actually looked at some of these lines. We had, I don't know, the last three years, eight, eight to 1,100 different hybrids, depending on the year, that we've actually screened for some colleagues at uh, Michigan State, a breeder there. We know that there's some specific genes uh, that are in some of the tropical germplasm that are highly resistant. So we can walk those fields. We can see very, very good levels of resistance there. The trouble is, is that's tropical germplasm, right? And so they either didn't make an ear, or the ear is this big, right? So uh, I think as the as the breeders can figure out how to get that intergressed into our hybrids, you know, we'll we'll start to catch up in terms of levels of resistance. But I really think, you know, time and time again, history history tells us some things, and when it comes for, when it comes to pathogens. It's usually always breeding and genetic resistance that gives us that strong foundation. Well, yeah. This might take a little longer to get there. This might take a little longer to get there. This is a complicated pathogen. This pathogen has a very intimate association with the plant here uh, at the at the you know host parasite level, and we need to understand that that a little better. Yeah, to make progress. Yeah, in the back first, and then I'll come over here. Yep. Sorry if you already mentioned this, but are you infecting the plants in the plots, or are you watching the disease coming? In? Ah, uh, great question. A lot of pathologists do uh, are heavy reliers on inoculation, which uh, you know, from a, I'm again trained as an epidemiologist, so I like to look at how pathogens move naturally through the agro ecosystem. Uh, in this case, this is a natural uh, type system. Now, with that said, we're generally doing this in um, what I call my petri plates at Arlington, which are corn on corn no till systems which are, are not something we would recommend, but this helps us get a lay of the land in terms of resistance level and then how those, those pathogens actually move. So we're not inoculating, but we are relying on existing inoculum there from a corn on corn system. Yeah. I think from an organic perspective, you all are set up a little better maybe than some of the conventional um, growers as well because uh, you're able to manage residue a little better okay so the local source of inoculum especially with rotations you know you, you all embrace rotations a little more than some of the farmers I work with and I think that's really really helpful there so so keep in mind anything you can do on a residue uh, side of things is really important am I promoting a mold bore plow no don't abandon conservation tillage I'm not telling you that because it can move a long distance Okay, so you still have, you know, inoculum that can move from outside into that field, but local sources of inoculum can at least be managed through that rotation. Remember, this is a polycyclic disease that has multiple cycles per, uh, per season. So like I said, if you can rely on scouting, make sure you're looking at the lower canopy first, and when you see it, remember that there's other infections that are happening and that's a continuum. Okay, so you need to be on it very quick. You could use some apps like Tar Spotter to sort of anticipate and understand what the weather uh, looks like to make those management recommendations. And then any, if anybody's an irrigator, we didn't spend much time there, but as you might expect, the longer we have leaf wetness there, uh, the more tar spot we can expect and irrigated systems we, we know are higher risk, okay? So you may need to adjust the irrigation patterns a little bit. We, we're working with some colleagues at Michigan State to understand how that uh, plays a role. We're looking at potentially actually irrigating, this is a little counterintuitive, potentially irrigating actually in the evening. And the reason for that is because those leaves are already gonna be wet anyway from dew events. Okay, so adding that moisture in the evening might help delay that or at least reduce the leaf wetness duration as we get into the daytime hours. Versus if we actually started irrigating, say in the early morning, you're gonna actually effectively lengthen that leaf wetness duration, which is really biologically important for this particular pathogen. All right, Kelly, shall we transition to a new disease? Yeah, question before we move, yep. Before we get away from tar spot, I was curious about, okay, so it's an obligate parasite of corn. How stable is the genetic profile of that particular disease? So like if we look at breeding resistance, is there a chance that resistance traits might not be able to compete with this disease more or less over time? Yeah, I, right now, again, because the population is reasonably not diverse, I think we'll have some time to catch, catch up to the pathogen. You're exactly right. Once we deploy 
some level of resistance, we are going to need to continue to monitor that. Again, history tells us what's going to happen, and if we look back at other pathosystems, this is a constant battle, right? So, you know, as we deploy those resistant genetics, we're going to have to watch that and continue to look for other forms of resistance and layer, so we can we can slow that resistance development by just layering approaches as well. So that's why it's a really a multi-point type management strategy, in my opinion. But you're exactly right; it's it's going to be an ongoing battle and just something we have to deal with like we do in other pathosystems. Yeah. All right, let's transition into, into soybeans here a little bit. This is, this is my first love, actually, is white mold. So pathologists are strange people. We have, we have, we have uh, pathogens we love, okay? And, and so these are our pets, and this is my, my favorite uh, pathogen of all time. Uh, and I spend a lot of time, I've spent 20 years working on this, this um, buddy of mine. And so... Different from a uh, tar spot, uh, white mold is, is what we call a monocyclic or a single cycle per season uh, disease. And, and, and from a management standpoint, that, that helps us out, okay? Because there's really only one window of opportunity for this particular fungus, and that's really during the bloom period in soybeans. Okay, so about 95% or so of the initial infections actually come during the, the bloom period. And there's there's a lot of really intricate biology that I'm not going to go into. We, we spend a lot of time studying this disease cycle, but these little sclerotia here, uh, I'll effectively call them rat turds because that's essentially what they look like, but that's what gives rise to this little mushroom-like structure. Okay, and you can see here's an actual picture of these structures right here. They're, they're pretty close to the soil. Uh, and, and as the canopy closes, um, in, in, you know, especially if you're in a wide row spacing, like a 30-inch uh, row spacing, as that canopy closes to the center, that changes the light and also humidity underneath that canopy, and that's what triggers the formation of this cup on top of that, that little stem there. And this is very closely timed with the bloom time in soybeans. So those spores are then ejected up into the canopy, they colonize the flowers, and then move down into the, into the stem of the soybean plant. <laughs> Once these infections happen, it's about three weeks before we actually see uh, the uh, development of the disease. When I first got the Wisconsin uh, chemical control and the conventional systems was starting to become, um, uh, you know, an important piece on the farm, and a lot of the farmers were actually spraying fungicides here, which was completely the wrong time. Okay, so when we think about our biologicals as well, and especially the biofungicides that are trying to compete with this uh, particular organism, we have to be thinking up here. We need to be applying even our biofungicides up here so they can actually outcompete that, that spore that's going to be landing on those, on those flowers. Okay, so our window starts at the beginning of flowering or the R1 growth stage and then goes to the beginning of pod, which is the R3 growth stage. That's the window of opportunity for the fungus and our window for any in-season management of, of this particular disease. Is this exclusive to uh, soybeans or other legumes as well? This is exclusive to 400 plus other hosts. So this is one of the pathogens that loves lots of different things. And this brings up a really good point and that this loves weed hosts, okay? So one of our management strategies for white mold is making sure that we can manage our weeds uh, in, in that system as well. So, you know, Kelly, I'm gonna actually transition over to Kelly here. She's gonna talk about some work we've been doing in the roller crimping system. I think from a weed management standpoint and a disease management standpoint, this is one tool that we really have to look closely at in the soybean system, especially on acres that we're gonna transition into organic because I think once we make that transition into organic, white mold becomes a little less of an issue, at least that's what we've learned uh, talking to some of the farmers, not to say it doesn't take care of it, but the competition we have, the rotations that you all are utilizing, that really does help reduce the inoculum load there. So, you know, we're kind of talking about these transition acres where there's a heavy history of white mold, you know, and some of the challenges that we see in those types of systems there. So you're exactly right that we need to worry about maybe to a certain extent our rotations. Uh, here in Wisconsin, we're rotating a lot with small grains and grass crops, which are non-hosts. So that's a good thing. So if we can work small grains in, uh, you know, wheat, I really like wheat in rotation with soybeans, as does our, our agronomist, our soybean agronomist. I think that's where we need to be looking is in that rotation and then coupling uh, the rotation with some of the strategies that Kelly's going to talk about here. And just expanded the vegetables at some point on that. <laughs> yeah, well, vegetables is a whole other ball game. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah, there's there's a lot. Unfortunately, there's a lot of vegetable hosts for this particular uh, pathogen. So that is a that is an issue. Yeah. I know you're going to talk about it, but cultivation. Cultivation. So, what we see in grain is that if we're uh, no-tilling and we're working the small grains into that no-till system, that actually is a better uh, better scenario for this particular uh, case. And the and the reason for that is actually very closely linked uh, with with the biology in, in in this disease cycle here. So these sclerotia. Uh, are, are in the, at least the viable sclerotia, the important ones that lead to disease are the ones in the upper two inch soil profile. Okay, so if we don't dis disturb that profile, we go to a, we transition to a no-till system and, and we especially work some small grains into that system. The small grains will actually trick the development of this, of this cup. Okay, so you have to think about white mold like weeds, right? In a weed seed, the sclerotia is like a weed seed. And so if we can trick the development of this and it shoots its spores into a non-host, we're eventually going to exhaust the, what we call the inoculum density that's in the upper two inch soil profile. Okay, so that's why we've, we have seen farmers transition to no-till, work small grains and, and into that system and lengthen that rotation out and they can eventually rotate themselves out of, the, out of this problem. The key here is that you have to be patient. The sclerotia can survive the literature says five to eight years. We think it's actually a little longer than that, eight to 10. And then the other word of caution is if you're coming in and you're gonna maybe do some soil disturbance, you got some compaction maybe on a headland or something like that, you could bring some sclerotia back to the surface. Okay, so you do have to be a little bit careful if you, if you break the ground there. Yeah. How does it get there? Is there, there a particular carrier host that brings it in? I mean, I know it blows in on the wind, but if it shows up somewhere, yeah. you know, transplant <clears throat> some seed, Dry sea or something like All that. the above, yeah. So it can be, uh, so this thing can be brought in through contaminated seed. Uh, we've seen that. In soybeans, and especially in conventional soybeans in Wisconsin, we've seen a really uh, steep uptick in incidence of white mold in, the, in recent years. We think that's related uh, almost completely to uh, Combine operations, custom combine operations, moving from field to field to field. These sclerotia actually get caught just like weed seeds in a combine, and you move that combine in the next field without sanitation, and we, you know, turn the rotor on, and out come a whole bunch of whole bunch of sclerotia. Okay, so you know, sanitation from one field to the next really, really important. Uh, the rotation is really important. Uh, certified seed, that's a really important piece as well that we see. So there's lots of different ways that in addition to just that air movement of those spores actually moving from one field to the next. We do know in soybeans that the what we call the dispersal gradient, so the, the movement of these spores in the soybean field is actually quite short. And the reason for that is because the soybean canopy density is, is, is extremely dense. And so to have a microscopic spore to be able to actually go up and out of that canopy is, is pretty unusual. And people have looked at this. That basically those spores go up, they hit the bottom of the canopy, and they kind of come back down right where, they, right where they develop. So in soybeans, at least, most of the infections that happen primarily come from within the field. So if we can manage the within the field inoculum load, we can help reduce the amount of infection there. So that's a good transition. I want to make sure Kelly can talk a little about some of the management here. So I'll turn it back over to Kelly. Yeah, so I'll talk about the trials we've done and then we'll kind of come back to management and if there are any more questions, we can do that too. Um, so for our white mold trials, we again use two different varieties. So um, Dwight was our more susceptible of the two varieties and MN 1410 was our more resistant. Um, then we again had a similar fungicide set up where we had a non-treated control, we had our conventional product, Endura, and then we had four different Omri approved products. Um, so we've got some Actinovate and Seraphel that you might remember seeing before, um, and then we have got a couple different Botry Stop and Double Nickel 55, and actually all four are um, biofungicides in this trial, so they're all, all uh, living microorganisms. And then on top of that, we did our, our tilled treatments. So we wanted to compare a tilled field versus a roller crimp dry cover crop field. So I'm not going to talk about 2021 for this trial because actually both locations, we didn't really have disease. Um, so yay for hopefully farmers in the area, but not for us in our disease data. Um, but in 22, um, 
I'll start with Indiana. So I'm gonna break apart the two different locations since we've only got this one year. In blue, blue you'll see Dwight, that's our more uh, susceptible of the two varieties. And then our MN 1410, um, you won't really see because we didn't have any disease in the resistant variety, which was pretty awesome. Um, and then on the bottom, you'll see the differences. On the left, we've got our two roller crimped um, trials, and then on the right, we've got our tilled. Um, so you can see with our resistant variety, we didn't really have a difference in disease because we didn't have disease. But then you look at that susceptible Dwight variety, and adding the roller crimp setup really helped lower those disease levels. Um, so we've got a plus there. As far as yields go, um, in Indiana, Dwight, the more susceptible variety, actually yielded a bit higher, but it's also a way different maturity group. So that's a 2.8 versus a 1.4 for them and 14.10. So I think that really takes care of most of that yield difference there. And then for Wisconsin, the story is a little bit more complicated. So I'm gonna take you on a visual journey through the saga of, <laughs> of our plots. Um, so a lot of you are probably familiar, have heard about the roller crimper, or maybe have used it. Um, here in this photo is our little small plot uh, roller crimper, so it's only 10 foot wide. Um, the first year we did this trial, we had some issues. Um, it's up in Hancock, so uh, about an hour and a half north. We've got more sandy soil up there. Um, and we really had trouble getting our ride actually laid down the first year that we used it up there. Um, so you'll see this big water tank on the back of it. We actually filled that to the brim to help add extra weight to this roller crimper. Um, so in the second year, you'll see the one that we crimped there. It actually did a lot better job. So yay for us in that regard. Um, but we kind of missed the mark. Um, so here you'll kind of see what our setup was. So we've got those green roller crimp strips, and then we have those brown um, they were mowed and then tilled under um, of the rye cover crop. But we kind of missed the mark on our tilled plots. So on the left, uh, you'll see the soybeans on that nice roller crimped rye, not many weeds, looking like a good stand. And then on the right, we've got um, maybe an equal amount of weeds and soybeans. Um, our stand count was not even half of what we had in our roller crimped setup. And what I think we figured out that we did wrong was we really only did the mowing and the tilling of the rye about five days prior to planting the soybeans. So I think we got some allelopathy from all that nice green rye uh, starting to decompose in there. Um, so lessons learned, one thing not to do is probably that. <laughs> yeah. That much residue, you were basically planting into a giant fluffy pillow. I mean, see the soil was also a little fact. It might. It, yeah, I mean, it, it It came up, although my planner, there's no pictures of my planner in here. My planner's uber heavy. Uh, I, I actually don't think that necessarily was the problem. I really do think it was probably the allelopathy from breaking the root system, mowing and that sort of thing uh, in that in that system. We the, the previous year we, we had um, the same sets of treatments, just from a stand standpoint, um, the roller crimps was not quite as good, although I will say the weed issues were pretty consistent with what you're seeing here. So, you know, I, I still think the roller crimping, if you can make it fit, I think is, is a really good piece here, both from a white mold standpoint, which we'll show you here in a second, but just from a weed uh, standpoint as well. You are touching on the point though that equipment is going to be really important in this system and, and we're constantly playing and tweaking with with equipment to try to make sure that we can get the best seed to soil contact and get through through the heavy residue yeah. could you go back to that tilled picture this one that center row has been tilled so, so these were tilled, but there's still a lot of residue here. We actually, uh, you can see the planter tracks in here. So we actually already planted uh, this. You can see the planter in here. I don't have a front mount on my, uh, on my tractor. So we have to unhook crimp first. And then we come back with my no-till uh, small plot planter and we can uh, plant these strips. So you can see uh, the, the, the uh, sweet paths uh, that, that were cleared as we went through there. Yeah. 
And now we did wait until like very close to anthesis when we mowed these and we tilled them under the same day. So by this time, and at 22, we actually had a lot higher, healthier of a stand of rye than we did in 21. Um, so I think just the fact that we had so much rye, so much biomass, and we incorporated that so close to planting, I think it was just that combination that really did it. So when I show you these results from Wisconsin, I'm, this is only the roller crimped trials because we basically just threw out those tilled plots. There wasn't anything worth really looking at there. Um, but on the left, you'll see our disease levels. Um, so again, you'll see Dwight in blue, that more susceptible variety, had considerably higher levels of disease than that MN 1410. We did see a little bit of disease here in Wisconsin in the MN 1410, even in that roller crimped rye. Um, but it really made a significant difference there. And then on the right, you'll see the um, yield levels. And as far as in Wisconsin, at least, that more resistant variety actually yielded better than the more susceptible. Um, and here you can see a video of our roller crimper in action. Um, but Damon, maybe you want to discuss kind of the putting these methods together and what really works. <laughs> yeah, so I think, you know, in this system, because there are so many hosts, uh, the sclerotia lives such a long time, we really have to think about multiple disease management options, right? So we have to layer lots of things together. There's no, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet uh, for this particular uh, disease. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little about what we've learned in the conventional side of things and how I, I see this actually uh, transitioning over into the organic side. Uh, so where I really think we got to double down is on variety choice uh, and then cultural practices, including this, this roller crimping system. So I'm going to talk a little about what we're doing with planting populations. And so um, we, we've done some work across the Midwest here where we have 10 site years of data now where we looked at planting populations. Uh, and, and we've done some work in the past in other uh, systems, but what was interesting about this work is where we run into um, manured ground or, or high-end ground, uh, we, we have uh, obviously a higher white mold risk because we have such a big uh, canopy that re results from those high-end grounds. So as you're thinking about this, we augmented with, um, with, some, with some nitrogen here just to make the situation a high-end situation. But the way to think about this would be sort of a high manure situation if you find yourself you know, near a dairy where you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of manure come on uh, a particular field. And this is where, you know, again, this is a conventional system where we're planting, you know, in May. I'll show you an organic system here in a minute where we actually had some of our new varieties. But what we're learning, at least on the conventional side, is where we really drop the, seed, the seeding rates down 100,000, even below 100,000. We're seeing substantial reductions here. And you'll see there are actually uh, conventional fungicides in here, but where we, where we get serious, especially in these high soil nitrogen conditions, where we get serious about the, the seeding rate, we, we, we really kind of negate the response, so to speak, that we get out of the fungicides. Yes, we get a little bit of a reduction compared to the non-treated here, but none of these fungicides really you know, uh, sort themselves out otherwise. Okay, so this was sort of a, where we were headed with starting to layer seeding rates into our roller crimping, um, uh, strategies and then bringing the variety resistance into that okay and what most people don't realize is I actually have a small uh, breeding program that's embedded in my pathology program we've been breeding and crossing soybeans conventional soybeans for about 10 years now uh, I received um, material from my predecessor Dr. Craig Grau uh, who gave us some of the initial resistant lines and we've we've subsequently uh, develop some what we think are pretty promising varieties that would fit an organic system. So these are conventionally bred uh, varieties here. Uh, these were released to Wisconsin Crop Improvement in uh, 2022. They did some increases uh, of these lines. Um, uh, this season they're going to do another increase next season. They think they'll have enough seed uh, for first sales for uh, 2024. But I want to show you some data here. Uh, with these lines because we think there's some pretty good opportunities here especially in the organic system 
This is a dark hilum. Uh, this would fit more of a convent, uh, more of an agronomic type system. This would be more of a food grade with a clear hilum here. And then this would be a specialty market bean uh, for the Asian market where they buy a lot of black seeded uh, uh, soybean seeds there. So we do have these three lines in addition to a fourth called 5282B, which you've probably seen some of that data here. So what, what I want you to know here is that we have, um, we have a couple of check lines. 5282B is our most, uh, up until this point, has been our most resistant. And then Dwight's our universal susceptible. And we've made actually really good headway. This 190 uh, is actually more resistant than our most resistant check that we had in our breeding program. So that tells us, you know, at least from a breeding perspective, that we've made some incremental uh, steps in the right direction in terms of actually imparting good genetic resistance, especially in uh, some of the conventional varieties. If you're curious about learning more about these, I would encourage you to look at Sean Conley's uh, conventional um, soybean trial. We actually entered these in his conventional trial. Uh, those were along with some other conventionals here, and we're in, right in the public section. So any of the W lines that are listed in that uh, table six in that uh, document, those are all out of our uh, breeding program, and some of these are on par with uh, Minnesota 1410, which has been the public standard in there. Okay, so high level of resistance, yes, we may not have the yield potential uh, in, 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 that some of the other companies have, but we think we have better resistance in there as well. So let's, let's bring it back around and just talk again. I, I'm just revisiting some data that, um, that Kelly showed you a little earlier, I think, Combining that resistance on top of the roller crimping is going to be the way to go here, especially in that transition ground where you got to move uh, maybe from conventional into an organic system and, and really taking advantage of both pieces here to, to tie that in. And then maybe thinking about the seeding rates. And this is where it gets a little bit, um, you know, this is where we can have a little bit of a debate because you're going, hey, Smith, I got to wait. If I'm going to be in a roller crimping system, I have to wait till that rye goes through anthesis, and clearly my planting date is going to be pushed back. So we actually looked at this. This is, this is just data in a non-white mold field because we wanted to just look at the performance of our lines under different seeding rates without a disease in the mix here. So we were just basically looking at yield. So you'll see our, our new releases here across the bottom compared to our susceptible check. And you'll see the different seeding rates. Uh, Aaron uh, gave us some lay of the land in terms of seeding rate range that we might look at. This was uh, in a roller crimp rye system on June 1st. Okay, so these are, these are some pretty respectable yields here. And actually we didn't see a strong, you see the bars bopping around here a little bit, but actually from a statistical standpoint, there's no significance. So what does that mean? That means if we repeat the study again, these bars are just gonna randomly reassort again. So what that tells us is we could get away with some of these lower seeding rates for even in the organic roller crimp system, which would help further reduce the amount of disease that we would actually have uh, in those environments. So let's just bring this home quick and then we, if we have time, we'll transition to one more disease uh, here. I, again, resistant variety right at the top. I think you have to spend the majority of your time looking for those resistant varieties, then crop rotation. Is, is next there. I think there's a lot of opportunity there, especially with, a, with, with corn and small grains in the system. Those are non-hosts. Uh, roller crimping. Row spacing, I didn't talk much here because we're seeing, at least in our work, that row spacing is not as big of a driver as the seeding rate is. So even if you want to plan in a narrow row spacing, I think getting serious about the seeding rate and at least dropping that seeding rate down a bit I think is the, is the way to go. And they keep track of those, those field histories and watch out for the manure applications because those are gonna be the higher risk uh, fields, especially if you're transitioning a particular field. All right, Kelly, I'm gonna turn it back over to you uh, on the small grain side of things now and we can talk about fusarium head blight. Before I jump to another disease, does anyone have any last questions about, yeah. <laughs> yeah so you were um, mentioning vegetable hosts. Um, one thing I use um, soybeans for is um, prior year to um, potatoes. And so that helps with some sort of potato things. Is potatoes a host for? Oh. Right, so I would be into because I'm not paying attention to the soybean, I'm just, you know, <laughs> I'm just grabbing whatever he happens to have. So. Mm. All right, I'll keep my eye on You mentioned transfer in seed, specifically in soybeans. 
Uh, is that a visual thing you can see? Are you looking for the little raptors that are in the soybean sample? Or if you clean the raptors out, are we still going to have transference of the disease? Yeah, excellent question. So um, good seed cleaning can help uh, because that gets rid of the raptors, okay, in that seed mix. However, the unfortunate part is, is if we get infections uh, closer to that R3 or beginning pod onset, we can have colonization of the pod, which results sometimes in what we call chalky seed, or seed that actually has mycelium embedded in the seed coat. That can happen. And that doesn't sometimes make, it, or those seed will actually make it through the cleaning process. So you, you have to be a little bit careful there too. And, and what I usually recommend if, if you're a seed grower, you're growing for seed, um, you know, you need to just be careful in monitoring how much white mold damage you have in a particular field. And if it's just really high, you might consider potentially doing something else with that seed. Um, so that is something you have to watch out for. Are, are the, is that seed colonization that's really hard to figure out whether it's colonized in some cases, unfortunately. Is yeah. there a way to do any testing to determine that? You, we, you could. Uh, it's, it's laborious because you have to take a seed sample that would have to come to a lab like my lab, and we're not a service lab per se, and that would have to be plated out. And I'm not sure if some of the seed labs will actually plate for that, but then they basically they'll plate a known amount, and then they'll look at the frequency of um, you know germination for, of the fungus off, off of that seed. So it is something you can do, but it is a big process, and I don't know if any lab that are actually doing that commercially. So yeah. your best bet is to choose your seed from a field that was not affected. That is the best way to go, yeah. Right. yeah. You guys aren't doing any seed sampling uh, from, from uh, you know, seed providers just to get a, a random idea of how much of it is out there floating or what you're putting in is potentially prior to your planting for your trials? Yeah, uh, we are not testing our own seed. We do our seed increases in fields without any history. So in our own seed, that's how we're managing that. We don't do, you know, testing of other companies. equipment, the equipment stays on farm, and there aren't any around farm contacts that could be blowing in from. I mean, you control that. We're, we're control, yeah. So our seed, the, any seed that comes through the Wisconsin Crop Improvement Association, they're doing all that the equipment cleaning. You know, they're inspecting those those seed fields, and the, that's all certified. Yep. Yep. All right, Kelly. And I will say, if you're like trying to figure out if your field has this, you can <laughs> scalp pretty easily. Um, if soybean get really infected with this, you can just see like very dead wilted patches in your field kind of late season ahead of when um, they should be kind of maturing. And then the sclerotia, they form on the inside of the stem, but you can also see them forming on the outside of the stem along with that white mycelium, that like fuzziness. So there are some like pretty good visual signs if you're looking to go out and scout a field before you use seed from that field too. All right, so the third disease that we're gonna talk about is Fusarium head blight. Um, so we did some wheat trials looking at this. Um, this disease falls kind of in the middle. Um, so corn and small grains are both hosts for this, um, but soybean is not, or legumes are not. Um, so, um, so really this disease, kind of like tar spot, it can survive in that residue and then um, Again, like soybean, when the wheat is flowering or at anthesis is when it's most susceptible to this disease. So if you have um, the residue that's infected from previous years, that can sporulate and then infect your wheat around anthesis. Um, and this disease, if you're scouting for it, you really start to see, um, prior to the grain heads actually drying out, you'll start to see random spikelets on there that are bleached or you might see the whole head or a big chunk of the head start to bleach. Um, and that photo on the bottom left, sometimes you can even see the spores. Um, so that has a little line of orange spores on the edge of it. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, and um, just like tar spot, this can overwinter um, through our winters here um, and just hang out on that residue till the next year. Like all these other diseases, this also enjoys moisture. Um, so that can help push the disease along too. So for this trial, we again had two different varieties. We had Kaskaskia, which is 
um, described as having moderate tolerance, so it's our more susceptible, and then harpoon was our more resistant variety. And then again, we've got our, our conventional fungicide, our non-treated, and four different um, OMRI-approved products. And here you can get a visual for the two different varieties. Um, in our first year of the trial, on the left we've got our disease levels, and then on the right we've got our dawn levels, so the mycotoxin from um, this seed actually harvested from those fields. So again, we didn't really see anything significant with the fungicide treatments. It all kind of came back to that resistant variety, the harpoon in blue, had much lower disease levels and lower dawn levels than are more susceptible of the two varieties. And this is just a look at our, our yield data. Again, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but when combined, uh, Wisconsin and Indiana, we didn't really see any significant differences. We actually saw harpoon, the more resistant, do better in Wisconsin, and Kaskaskia maybe do slightly better in Indiana. But yeah, and then in this year, in 2022, um, again, we saw pretty similar results um, where our resistant variety um, did a lot better as far as disease levels, what we were seeing in the field, and then with the dawn levels as well. Uh, and then in the second year, um, Harpoon had a higher yield in both locations too. So more, more resistant and slightly higher yielding as well. And then just to show you in the second year, we did see that our ProSaro is our conventional treatment. So we saw a decrease from that. As far as all the organic products go, we didn't see any difference between those and the non-treated. So we didn't see anything noteworthy there. But I do want to bring back, you might see that Prosaro and see that drop there and think, but we don't have access to that. But our resistant variety, Harpoon versus Kaskaskia, had a very similar drop in disease. Um, so you can get a very similar effect just from that resistant variety, even though you don't have access to that, um, that conventional fungicide. So just to come back to our kind of takeaways for controlling Fusarium head blight, again, we saw that that resistant variety really um, had the biggest benefit. Um, rotation is a big thing because it can survive on um, the cereal crops and the corn. Um, sometimes it's not a good idea to put your wheat right after corn, especially if you saw gibberella ear rot or stalk rot in your corn. Um, that's the same pathogen um, so if you saw that, then it really might not be a good idea to put a small grain after it. Um, and just looking at your residue management, if you can chop that up or that sort of thing and help that kind of degrade faster, that's a benefit. Um, but like tar spot, there is some wind transfer of Fusarium head blight too. Um, so this can blow in from other fields as well. Again, like I said, flowering and then early grain fill are the most important times for um, when your crop is susceptible to this. Um, and then another unique, um, unique aspect of control that you have with this disease is at harvest, you can tweak your combine fan speed um, because these um, infected kernels that kind of look like the ones on top, they call them tombstone kernels, so they get really dry um, they're really shriveled up. Um, because they're so much lighter than a normal healthy kernel, you can increase that combine fan speed a little bit and blow some of those out um, while you're harvesting, um, which puts them in your field, but it keeps them out of your harvested crop. Um, and then just keeping an eye on your fields and harvesting those um, infected fields separately from your cleaner fields can help keep your dawn levels down for when you're actually taking that grain in so you don't end up in a pickle there. And then if you know that you've got infected kernels that you're harvesting, just the conditions you're storing them in too can have an effect. So getting that cooled down and dried um, to a lower moisture level um, can really help just keep the disease from increasing more in storage. So because we know that resistant variety is really important, um, we have set up a winter small grains variety trial um, so we planted that this fall. We don't have any results to show you yet for that. Um, but we really just want to see, one, how these varieties perform, survive our winter, and do in the area. 
And then two, just see how resistant they are to Fusarium headlight. Um, so if anyone has any recommendations for different types of small grains that they have an interest in, if you don't see that here, we'd love to hear from you and maybe add those in the future. Um, so yeah, to start, we've got some soft reds, some hard red, winter wheats, and then some rye, and a couple of different barleys on there too. Yeah. All right, we're uh, kind of starting to run down on time. In fact, we're probably up against our, our hour here. I want to just leave you here uh, probably on this slide because this is usually where we get a lot of our questions, especially in the organic side of things is, you know, just where is the utility? And I can let Kelly kind of talk a little about what we've learned here in a second. But one thing I do want to just sort of uh, leave you with again is that resistant variety thing, right? So you've heard that common thing all the way through here. And I think if we're going to utilize uh, these fungicides, and Kelly talked about initially, um, you know, the first couple of slides about the challenges that we see where you know, things that look really good in the, in the lab, in the greenhouse, uh, don't look so good in the field, right? And we actually, we had a couple of postdocs in the lab uh, this year. They were very interested in organic tea and, 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 and looking at some of those and, and the disease benefits. They had some really impressive data uh, in a soilless greenhouse system. It looked really promising. And we took it to the field, uh, Kelly, and, and it just, it, it didn't seem to pan out there. And, and keep in mind the complexity, you know, and you all know this, the complexity of those environments in the field, in the soil, you know, that really uh, challenges also our microbes that we're adding there, right? And, and so we think that that has to be layered if we're going to take advantage of these types of tools, that has to be layered with these other approaches that we've been talking about. And again, I think the resistance is, is really the key. So Kelly, why don't you bring it home on your, your uh, notes here on the offering side of things. Yeah, so like he said, resistant varieties, number one. I think uh, your management practices, cultural practices, your, like your rotations are probably number two. Um, but to get back to the question of whether these OMRI fungicides can actually help, um, one of the takeaways I found from kind of comparing our results and comparing um, kind of the recommendations for them, these products can be a lot pickier than our conventional fungicides. Some of them have really specific directions about using immediately after mixing or constantly agitating throughout um, application or have different temperature or pH specific specifications. So I think just paying really close attention to those um, might help, but it does kind of make things more challenging for using those products. Again, like we mentioned before, our trials weren't on organically managed land, so how your land responds to different products probably depends on the microbes that you have and the health of your plants to begin with. Um, there are a lot of different possible application times too. So we didn't apply any of these uh, OMRI products either more than twice in a season. Most of them were only applied once. Um, with our tar spot in Wisconsin, we applied our fungicides twice. Um, but some of these recommend applications every 7 to 14 days, looking at like four or five applications in a season. Again, this kind of comes back to whether you want to put the time and the money into trying a product that many times. That's kind of why we erred on the side of um, fewer. Um, we thought that this might be something that farmers might actually want to try at that sort of application timing rates. Um, and then one other possible benefit that I saw on some labels is maybe you could try a spreader sticker to help these, especially because we were working with foliar fungicides for the most part. Um, and some of these, because they're a living organism that needs to germinate on your crop or on your soil, you might need higher uh, water mix amounts in there than you would normally. So everything that we applied, we used 20 gallons per acre as our water mixing amount. But some of these recommend 30 up to 500 gallons an acre. Um, so there's a big range there too. Um, so I think if you want to try these products, I think it's good to really read into their recommendations and maybe do that before you buy the product so you kind of know what you're getting yourself into and whether you want to um, go through all of that. Um, but again, there might be some benefit there, but so far we haven't had a whole lot of luck with it. Um, yeah. So 
I'm gonna skip a couple of these and thank you for joining. But if you have any more questions about this or anything, I know we're out of time, but my email's up there. Um, you can also feel free to, to uh, touch base with me after this or email me and uh, yeah, we'd be happy to answer any other questions too. So, thanks. stage uh, pre-application prior to that flowering stage that you were talking about? Which, which? For, for white mold? Okay. <laughs> for, for white? So one, the soybeans. Yeah. Soybean, soybean white mold? Yeah, so, soybean white mold. So um, are you talking about soil applied products or are you talking about prior well, to the flowering? Well, we about how you guys applied it. We assumed it was all foliar. It spray. is, yeah. So, I mean, if you know what happens generally at that flowering stage, and it appears, did you try any pre-spray right before that flowering stage? Yeah, so, so again, you have to, you know, this is where knowledge of the biology of the organism is really important because we know that the, the infections happen through the flower. So we've done stuff in, in previous years where if we apply prior to flowering, it's almost like we don't okay. do anything at all, right? So that's why even on these biological labels, they always tell you to start at flowering for the white mold thing because you gotta have, you gotta have the right host parameters there for the pathogen to interact with it in order to try to actually control it. Now, with that said, there are biological tools that can be applied to the soil uh, pre-plant actually for white mold and, the, and what's actually going on there, so there's a product called Contans. We didn't mention it here, I've done work with Contans in past years um, and that product actually does look decent um, and, and what basically you're doing is you're applying another fungus to basically parasitize the rat turds. And it does a pretty good job, but you have to be patient. It can take a couple of reapplications of that product over a you know two or three year time span to get that population built up. Uh, you also have to have some moisture available, and they like to to see that product actually applied after the crop is harvested in the fall, which is a little different than what the label actually reads. But the research is showing that if we actually apply it in the fall, that gives the fungus some time to actually parasitize those those sclerotia. So there is, that is an option, it's, it can be pretty expensive, but something to look at and, and you're actually reducing that inoculum density uh, with that particular organism. Yeah. yeah. So my question is on white mold. So we don't do as many soybeans, but we do dry beans. So I'm not 100% sure if the flowering date differs, um, but we're, and we're also in 15 inch rows. So we commonly plant at 125,000 um, and we see um, variety dependent um, in population, the amount of white mold. So obviously the two biggest things that you said is um, uh, resistance and um, no-till, and those don't work in a driving situation. So is there a way we could like cultivate right as those spores are coming up, or what's another I guess, potential? Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, point. You you can, and in fact, in our uh, disease blocks, we we intentionally don't cultivate because that actually disrupts the mushroom. So you touch on a really important point that we didn't uh, mention here is that yeah, in 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 season cultivation, especially just prior to that bloom time, can be quite beneficial from a disease management reduction standpoint. What you're actually doing is disturbing. Um, the formation of that little mushroom. Yeah, so that's a that's a place to look. It, the dry bean thing is more complicated because the resistance levels aren't up to what we have, say, in, in soybeans. And so there's some in, increased challenges there. Aaron and I are on a grant um, led by Cornell, so we're we're going to be actually starting some dry bean work uh, this year. Uh, so we're hope, hopeful to learn some more. And one of the one of the big pieces of that is actually looking at new breeding lines and the dry bean side and trying to integrate those into our uh, dry bean system. So, so stay tuned there because we are aware of those challenges in the dry bean system, but I think there's some opportunity there as well. Yeah.